Now, I don't know about you, but I love to paint big. In this short video, let me share with you some of my favorite techniques. Welcome to another painting video. My name's Andrew, and if you're new here, this is the place where I talk about all things to do with painting. So consider subscribing. Now, I wanna share with you some of my favorite techniques for tackling a big picture, and even share with you some really cool tricks when it comes to painting things like sunbeams shining out of clouds, and also how I paint water. Now, this painting is all about Milford Sound, which is one of the most spectacular landscapes I've ever come across. It's an absolutely epic scene down here in the South Island of New Zealand. Now, if you've been watching me for a little while, you know I love to do things with hindsight. If I've been there before, and I already know the road ahead somewhat, then I can work out where those pitfalls are gonna be. So I always love to have a plan before commencing any big project. Now that's gonna include some pencil sketches as well as an oil sketch. Now an oil sketch is just a small oil painting where I can work out my colors, what the palette's doing, and get a bit more information on that composition. It's like flying blind if you attempt to paint a big painting before doing any of this groundwork. But once you've done this, then you know the road ahead and it's so much easier. I added an extra step here and I decided to produce a digital design. So I really know what that composition's doing, what all my tones and colors are doing. And so I have something that I can use to transfer to that bigger canvas. Before we get into this section of the painting, in a previous video, I showed a section where I was projecting my design onto the canvas. And I had all sorts of people in the comment section going, ha ha, now I know how you do it. You trace everything you do. And I thought, hmm, maybe they missed something. Here, this is what I'm doing. I've actually drawn something by hand. Yeah, granted, I used a Wacom tablet in a digital process, drawing it directly into Photoshop, but this is my design. It's not a photograph projected up onto the canvas where I'm slavishly tracing away a photograph. No, this is my own design, my own drawing. Now I'm projecting it because this is the easiest way that I can get such a huge thing done. It's the easiest way to get my drawing up onto the dang thing. So in order for me to just get on with it and just start working, I could have used either a grid or drawn it meticulously by hand, but I thought, I got a projector sitting here. Maybe I should just go for it. So. Again, I don't see anything wrong with using a projector. If you want to project your own photograph, you can do that too. Whatever gets you creative and painting in the studio, awesome. For me, if it's my own drawing or my own design, I see no issue with using technology to get that onto the bigger canvas so you can get stuck into painting sooner. So now that you've seen my dirty little secret, let's jump right back into the process. So like a total hack, I project this straight onto the Belgian linen stretcher and trace it off following those lines. Once I have my design in place, I tone that canvas. I never like to work on a stark white background. This color here really helps add an extra dimension of warmth and resonance, and it works so well with those first strokes of color to go down. Now I block in this thing pretty quickly using some big Tisch dagger brushes. Oh yeah. 
That brush is named after me. You can find out all about it by clicking the link in the description down below. And for a limited time, you get yourself 30% off. Thanks, Rosemary & Co. The block-in is probably one of the fastest parts of the painting process, but our entire composition gets established in just about one sitting. I'm working pretty thin here, trying to cover as much ground as quickly as possible. Now, I'm not watering down that paint with copious amounts of medium. I'm actually using the paint and just brushing it out thin. I never mix more than 25% liquid in with any given layer. And again, if you missed it, these are oils mixed in with Winter Newton Liquid Original. I block my painting in in a systematic way, starting with whatever's furthest away from the viewer and work my way forward. And as I do this, my tones get more and more intense and the colors become more saturated. And this helps me create a sense of depth within the scene right from the outset. Now, before we really get stuck into painting, let me just explain what my painting process is in brief. I follow a methodology for pretty much every oil painting I do, and that is a simple three-step process, which is blocking in, modeling, and detail. Now, we've just blocked in the painting here, and now you can see everything's up on that canvas. So once that layer is dry, and it's a very thin layer, mind you, I can then layer back over the top with some modeling. This is where I start to get a little bit more detailed, the brush strokes get a bit finer, and the mark making is a bit more fragmented, and I start to build up that surface. And once that's done, then I move on to the detail. I used to try to rush into the detail process, but I found it's much easier following this three-step method. Let's jump into it. If I mixed about 25% medium in with my paint layers, generally it's dry the very next day and I can add another layer over the top. And as I do this, it gets richer and richer. Now I'm not trying to get any thickness here really in the paint layer, but I just wanna start creating a touch of texture and create some more interesting brush strokes and just add to the level of richness to the surface. My colors are also starting to get more intense and a touch more saturated. Again, depending on where in the painting I'm working. But now is my opportunity to really clearly delineate individual features in this landscape and start to render each and every form. I work my way up to the detail layer. I find the detail has to be earned. Early on in my career, I just wanted to rush straight into it. Consequently, I created a lot of work and it was just abortive. But this process has saved me so many times. So I begin things very loose and sketchy, covering a lot of area and then work my way towards specifics. Now I try to take the lead from the old masters and more and more in my painting process, I'm using materials that they used. One of the most important things for building a painting right comes down to using lead white. Now, if you can get your hands on lead white, it's gonna really pay dividends in the end because what this stuff does is it adds to the structural integrity of your painting. This painting is really starting to shape up, but there's a long way to go. From here, what I do is break up that sky and allow some windows in this portion so I can shine light down into the scene. Now, maybe I'm biased because these brushes happen to have my name on them, but there's something about the Tisch Dagger that's just perfect for laying down these clouds. And I love the way the clouds break apart and catch the light. It's great to have a good brush for this technique. Now the daggers are good for a broad stroke, a fine line, or for some nice random marks as I twist that handle. Slowly over time, I add to the complexity of the surface, just layering brush strokes on top of one another. And now as I'm beginning to build up some of that thickness, I'm using some liquid impasto medium. Again, no more than 25% mixed in with my oil paint. Now, the thing I love about painting, so when we get up close to it, we can see all of those individual brush marks, but the minute we step away, there's this illusion of detail, and what we have looks really resolved and really crisp. But it's all just an illusion. The detail is implied. Now, we've got so many more cool detail techniques to talk about in this little video. Now, I'm always holding back from the top of my tonal range, saving my tonal best for last. This is vitally important when it comes to painting a scene like this. We want to have a sense of direct light, some really strong aspects within this painting, but also we want to have a lot of subtlety and some quiet areas as well. So holding back with that tone and not blowing out the entire dynamic from the outset, it's going to be really important. And that lead white helps me gradually approach the top of that tonal range. So I'm always holding back here in the initial stages, but as the painting moves on, we're gonna get brighter and brighter and brighter. 
Now I've not only been holding out with that tone, but also my color and saturation. I hold back with greens. Greens are a really dangerous color when it comes to painting a landscape. If we get too much yellow out in that green and it's too strong, it comes too far forward. So what I do is desaturate this, gray it out and push it way back. Conversely, as those tiers of depth come forward, the green gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And it's by playing with these tonal relationships as well as these color relationships that allows me to create a sense of depth in the scene. So as I begin to layer over the top of this and start adding some details here in the foreground, I'm gonna get a bit more intense with my tones and my colors. That green is so much stronger, but also the tone in this tree is so much darker. So it's gonna to start to leap ahead of that distant mountain. I'm working with several different tones and colors all at once to create relief in all of these areas in the painting. And we're only given an indication of texture and form because we have a difference in those tones and colors. Now again, I'm gonna talk about this a whole bunch in the full version of this tutorial. This painting is all about the crispy details. Some of my favorite stuff to paint are things like this log here in the foreground. This just really sets the mood and the stage for the painting. It's just little areas like this, little pops of detail that form these visual treats for the viewer. And just like the overall painting itself, any individual element, I start off pretty general and then work my way towards those specifics, rounding out the form in the beginning and then adding all of those little embellishments over the top. Now, as you have seen here, this is a huge painting. So an area like the foreground here with all of these individual elements takes me about a week to two weeks to just cover this area alone. Let's talk about some tricks here for painting grasses. Again, I'm starting pretty general, working my way towards specifics, brushing in some of this texture with a fan brush as well as a palette knife. I load the palette knife edge on, and these things are actually great precision painting tools. Now when painting something like grass, it takes a heck of a long time to build up any kind of detail and texture across that surface, but it is worth it. By just sticking with it and using a variety of tones and colors, I can create all sorts of interesting textures right here in the foreground. When creating individual blades of grass like this, I go back and continually reload that palette knife. These sorts of details really draw the eye. And again, it takes a while, but man, it is so worth it. In the full version of the tutorial, I'm gonna show you a bunch of palette shots where I talk about individual color mixes. Now here with these foreground rocks and a bit of nice, warm and brighter tone, I get to begin to define each and every stone. Now I'm working again simultaneously with that shadow and that highlight. Each and every rock has got to appear as a unique shape. This technique also takes a little while, but it's important that we create a natural looking dynamic so we don't form any distractions that will take away from the overall image. Now, when I was originally blocking in this water, I wanted to establish what the overall composition was gonna look like, but I knew I had to come back and firmly establish what was happening underneath the reflective surface. Now, I break apart the water into sections that I can get my head around. So this first one, I'm just focusing on that underlying layer. I'm gonna come back and layer over this area, so I only wanna create a moderate amount of texture with the brushwork. Now, rather than give the water the whole treatment all the way across, I lift out little tones and colors here and there to create more interest under the water. Now, we'll come right back to the water in just a second, but first, let me share with you a super secret technique for painting sunrise. Now, the light in the painting is a constant. It's gonna be emanating from one source and traveling in straight lines. I need to anchor exactly where the sun is in this scene. So I'm using this super secret special technique, which is simply a screw and some bricklayer's twine. So now I know that wherever that sun is shining, it's gonna be traveling in a straight line from that single source. So then I can stretch this string out and I have this as a guide to be able to place all of my highlights. Little tricks like this have helped me so much with creating a new level of realism within my paintings. Having a singular source for that light is absolutely essential in landscape painting. There's only one source and that's the sun. Now following those gaps in the clouds above, this is helping me establish exactly where individual highlights are going. 
I use the shadows cast by this string as a guide for the sun rays that are shining out of these clouds. Now this here is a glaze. It's just a thin amount of pigment suspended within a medium. I've used glazes throughout this painting process to help me push the realism and three-dimensionality. So the water is now completely dry as I attempt to lay this glaze over the top. And I start off tentatively with a very thin amount of glaze and just establish where that mountain is reflecting down into the surface of the water. It doesn't take very much of this glaze before that water takes on a crystalline appearance. Now while the glaze is still wet, it's totally removable. And we can even move it and shift it around on the surface, but once it's dry, it's there for the duration. So if I have to go back and fix it up, then I need to go back to the start of the process and begin to repaint. So I have a limited window of opportunity here to make sure I've got things in the right place. As I bring the glaze towards the viewer, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. This is mimicking that phenomenon where the reflection is weaker, closer to us as a viewer, as we look directly through the surface of the water. But when we're looking across it, that's when the reflection is strongest. So you'll notice here, there's some difference in that glaze from the immediate foreground as it approaches the midground. With soft sweeping strokes, I can even create some ripples across the surface. I don't try to get the glaze to do all of the work in one sitting. Rather, I come back over many sittings and just build it up bit by bit, constantly checking for its effectiveness. Now, it's important when you're painting something this big to continually get up out of your chair and view it from a distance and evaluate the overall situation. Once I have that glaze down, reflecting the mountains and the sky, I come back and worry about anything sitting on the surface that might be reflecting down into the water. I want to have some variation in the surface of this water. I imagine that the winds gently come across and just touch the surface here and broken up that water just a little bit. And where this happens, I'm going to apply a chattered technique with a light glaze color to just create a bit more interest. And then I decide where that light's coming from and where we might have a bit of sparkle. This is why I save my tonal best for last, because it's at this point in the painting that I bring out the big guns and lay down the brightest brights that I can muster. And this is pure white with just a touch of impasto medium. This is the last step of painting water where I worry about any of those individual surface details, like the sparkle and the meniscus as a solid object enters the body of water. My favorite marks are those last little bits of light coming out of the sky. And I decide the painting's finished when I can't think of another brush stroke to add to improve the situation. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Now, this was just a snippet of the full process of painting this epic painting of Milford Sound. Now, this project was on the easel in the studio for well over 300 hours. So, of course, I could only show you just a little bit of what we have to talk about. But I made a much more detailed version, over seven and a half hours long, and you can find that full version right now on my website. Simply go to the link in the description down below and it'll take you over to my website where you can check out that full version. Now again, if you got anything out of this short little video, imagine what we can do with seven and a half hours. In that period of time, I don't hold anything back and I share with you my painting process. Now for a limited time, you can get yourself 30% off. Simply click that link in the description down below and check out the full version of this tutorial. And I thank you very much for checking that out. And thank you so much for your support. Now, if you enjoyed this video, then please click that like button for me. If you wanna come back for more and see more painting videos just like this one, then make sure you're subscribed to this channel. As always, you can find me through Instagram and Facebook. Those links are down below as well. 
But most important, make sure you subscribe through my website at andrewtischler.com. Thanks so much for stopping by. I've really enjoyed your company and I'll see you again very, very soon.